Uh, so hopefully everyone's still awake. It's kind of late toward the end of the day, but um, I promise I will mostly show pictures and then try to talk to you about something that hasn't really been talked about today, which is fungi. And I was very happy to be invited to this uh, conference, but uh, I was also quite surprised because when I first got the email, I was like, oh, cognition and neuroscience, have they emailed the wrong person? Uh, but then, you know, thinking about what I've been working with and the kind of questions that I've been asking myself, uh, I found it as a fun challenge to try to see if I could present my work to this audience. So you'll have to let me know how it went afterwards. So I was working with fungi. I was running all these experiments, sitting in front of the microscope for hours and hours. And I started thinking about behavior. So what is fungal behavior? Well, there are a few challenges that are true for all forms of life. And one is how to obtain energy and nutrients. Another challenge is to figure out how to avoid being eaten or killed. And a third, how to spread your offspring. And of course, all organisms also have to figure out how to partition their resources between these activities. And this is true for fungi as well, even though they are not often considered uh, in the context of behavior. So behavior in general, when people try to define it, you talk about movements, interactions, cognition, and learning. And these are not terms that fungal biologists are used to using when we talk about our organisms. Um, behavioral ecologists also, they differentiate between innate behaviors and learned behaviors. But in fungal ecology, uh, what's mainly being discussed is fungal traits. And even though behavior, uh, our type of traits, uh, it hasn't been discussed very much for fungi. So one of the main things I think why fungal biologists have been kind of scared of talking about behavior or maybe not thought of talking about behavior is that fungi have been considered these sessile organisms uh, that are just kind of static where they are, but uh, that view is changing. And uh, if you haven't read this paper, <laughs> maybe you haven't read everything about fungi, but uh, the, there was this uh, uh, guy, Bielschik et al., like in, based in, in Berlin, uh, who published this really interesting paper on fungal movement and how fungi could be considered as moving organisms. And uh, their definition of uh, movement was that it was any translocation of biomass sustained by an organism's own energy resources, which is steered in response to environmental cues and stimuli. So by this definition, then fungi move a lot. They grow and they change. And they, I will show you some examples later on that like when you speed things up, you can actually see that fungi are not static at all. So I started thinking about not just movement, but, but behavior and behavioral ecology. And I got interested, like, have anyone done anything with behavioral ecology for fungi? Can we think about fungi in this way? And also importantly, I think I started thinking, can it help us as a community in fungal ecology to add this layer of questions that you have when you look at behavioral ecology? And in my opinion, it does. Uh, and one of the things that I, that I looked at was these, uh, these Tinbergen's four questions. Uh, and I think for fungi, uh, all of these questions can be addressed as well. Uh, they're mainly focusing on how the behavior improves survival or reproduction, how it has changed through evolution over time, what factors led to a specific behavior seen in a specific instance, and how the, behavior in an in, how the behavior in an individual changes as it matures. Uh, but what I also realized when I looked through this question is that some of these things might be a lot more difficult to try to answer uh, in fungi or even study in fungi. 
So what's so special with fungi? Why, why haven't everyone done all this for fungi already? Well, it is challenging. Fungi are challenging. <laughs> they are uh, not so easy to study as it might seem. And I think if you look to, uh, yeah, you're right over here, uh, my right, uh, you have a mushroom, which is what most people are familiar to seeing when it comes to fungi or buying in the grocery store. This is something that most people have seen some kind of mushroom, maybe not this specific one out in the field, but like um, a button mushroom in the grocery store most people are familiar with. And what people don't know in general is that uh, these mushrooms, it's not the actual body of the fungus. The body of the fungus when it comes to these filamentous fungi uh, are the hyphae that form large mycelial networks either underground or inside trees. And um, if you're only looking at the mushroom, it's just like a small uh, piece of uh, the organism that it produces in order to reproduce. So fungi are, like I said, they are these hyphae, these mycelia. Uh, and they are indeterminate. So they are constantly adapting. They don't form, they don't become like a finished form and stay that way, uh, but they sh constantly change. So that also makes it a challenge uh, if you want to study fungi throughout their lives. But they, what's really fascinating with them as well is that they are able to sense and experience multiple things at the same time in different ends of these large mycelia, which sometimes uh, with some of them have been measured to be up to kilometers wide. Of course, that doesn't go for all fungi, but uh, th there's the potential to have these long translocations over long distances. Um, but it can also be very difficult to uh, distinguish individuals, uh, especially in field contexts. And how do you determine the age out in the field? That is something that uh, I thought was a really interesting question that I had not thought about at all until I started looking at things like learning, then okay, age, but age, how do we do age in fungi? And from what I have uh, found, like most of the measurements of age, where in some cases they have said that, okay, this, we think that this uh, individual is up to 5,000 years old, uh, and then they have done that by measuring the size of it, and then said, okay, well, it grows this many centimeters per year, but, but how can we know that that is actually, what if one year it didn't grow so much, right? Or what if one year it grew a lot? So uh, I think that's something that's really fascinating. We don't really know the differences between old and young fungi. Uh, and I think it would be really cool if we can try to figure that out a bit more. Another thing with fungi, as I mentioned a little bit, is that they are networks. They don't just form networks with others, they are networks. The mycelia is a network. And then of course this network can connect to other, uh, and both, both other fungi, other plants, or, or it can uh, combat other ones. So it's, uh, but it's interesting to think about as well that it, it is a network in itself. So what I was really interested in and what I've been wanting to do is to kind of Imagine what life is like for a fungus to discover kind of the fungal umbelt. So how do fungi experience the world? What is it like to be this time kind of indeterminate organism that grow out into these tunnels, microscopic tunnels out in the soil or inside a tree? Uh, how do they perceive their environment and which senses and behaviors do they utilize uh, to find food, survive, and reproduce, like we talked about, all these challenges that they have just like other organisms. Uh, so I approached this woman, Lynn Body, who is a fantastic uh, mycologist, who has actually worked uh, with trying to figure out a bit of how fungi explore their environments. Um, and what she has done, she has used these uh, soil trays uh, where she has looked at more of a microscop macroscopic uh, level how uh, different fungi search for things and interact with other fungi. Uh, and uh, together with her, uh, I wrote this paper on fungal behavior uh, that was published in Trends in Ecology and Evolution, where we just tried to summarize you know, what 
uh, types of behaviors could, could we expect in fungi and what are the limits of what we know and where should we explore further. So if, to, if this talk isn't enough for you, you can always go read that afterwards. Uh, but what we found after this, like we actually got a lot of positive response from the fungal community. And I know there's been talk about people being, you know, shunned from grants and, you know, that the kind of danger of saying controversial things. And we, were, we didn't really know how people were going to respond, but I found that there was a positive response. And in my case, I got money to start my own lab, so <laughs> it, it has been beneficial for me. But of course, we, there's, there'll be, we'll have to see where everything goes. But what we can see now that if people are starting to, to use these uh, ideas more, talking more about fungi behaving, and there's uh, like a whole wealth of new interesting avenues of research for, for fungi. So for example, you know, looking into how these fungi that can manipulate uh, the other organisms in order to reproduce or for their own reproductive benefit. Uh, also, there has been studies looking at how fungi respond to injury, uh, how fungi will trade, reallocate resources and carbon in soil, work together with plants, um, fungal communication and interaction with organisms from other branches of life, and things also like electrical signaling, which has been talked about here. There are people that are starting to study this uh, in fungal mycelia as well. So uh, I'm gonna go a little bit into how, how we have approached uh, studying fungal behavior. So uh, a little bit like Alison talked about before, like we are, want to learn about these organisms that live in the soil. The soil is uh, very hard to look into what we can't do what my colleague Jonathan is doing here, which is to sit and observe the organism and see what it's doing. That doesn't work with a fungus that's growing down in the soil. The soil is dark. We can't just put our heads down in the soil and see what's happening. Uh, so we had to figure out other ways. And transparent soils has been uh, an, an interesting thing uh, that has been used for fungi as well, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, some other methods that we're using. So traditionally, when, uh, you co when people work with fungi in lab settings, uh, we have been growing fungi on these homogeneous media, like agar plates, where they have nutrients everywhere and no kind of physical obstructions. So that is not so much like what it's like in the soil. And that's why I said some of these uh, other studies looking at uh, mycelial foraging have uh, worked with... Uh, these compacted soil trays that you saw there, like uh, the work by Yu Fukasawa. Uh, and, uh, but what we wanted to do was to take it to the microscopic level, to actually try to figure out what is happening at the hyphal tip level, where we think that the actual decisions are being made by the fungi. So we started working with these microfluidic ship systems. Uh, and they are, commonly used in, in biomedicine, but it is a growing field in uh, microbial biology in general, uh, and kind of new to the field of microbial ecology. So like using ecological, trying to answer ecological questions uh, of microbes. Uh, but what is really neat with them is that you can design what you want the environment to look like, and you can create these microscopic structures where you can single out individual hyphae uh, and make channels that are smaller than a strand of hair. Uh, so instead of growing things on these uh, agar plates, uh, we, were, we decided to try to grow the fungi into these uh, ship structures where we created all these uh, obstacle courses and channels and um, patches with different pillars that, uh, to simulate kind of grains of sand and stuff. Uh, and I actually have some with me in my purse, so I can pass them around afterwards if people are interested or they can come, uh, come look uh, and you can see the size of it. It is about this big. Uh, oh yeah, I was just gonna say that it made of, out of, uh, commonly made out of PDMS, which also allows oxygen to go, go through it, which is kind of a requirement for the fungi to grow in there too. Um, so we started working with these systems and like I said, we were, what we were trying to promote was like that 
to show people in microbial ecology that these systems can be used for ecological questions too. You can design uh, what they look like and I guess adjust them for the purpose of your questions. Uh, so the first one that, that we made, uh, it had a few different uh, parts of it. So it had channels where we could measure how fast they were growing and if they were preferring like uh, wider channels versus uh, tighter channels if they were like. So we we're trying to see the limitations of the fungi. What were they able to get through? Um, but also explore some more wild combinations of things in so-called like obstacle courses. Um, and I don't know if I need to go through the, the whole fabrication process of it, but basically uh, it's like a molding process when you make these chips. So you make a design and then uh, you create a mold that you then mold from and then you bond it together with a glass slide. Uh, so they can be a bit time consuming to make the chips, but uh, inside of the chips you can have things uh, replicated a lot because it's such, such a micro scale that it's really neat. Um, so one of, a few of the things that we wanted to do to start off looking at fungi and fungal behavior in these uh, chip systems uh, was to try to look at things like directionality, space exploration, and a little bit of decision making. Uh, so there has been uh, some previous studies where they had worked with uh, also with microfluidic systems uh, with other types of fungi. So here. Uh, with Neurospora crassa, for example, the Nicolau group here is a, showing a video from, from one of their papers where they had uh, grown fungi through these uh, uh, kind of square little mazes. Uh, and uh, they had suggested in some of their papers that, you know, turning more than 90 degrees is a big challenge for fungi. Uh, but we wanted to see, you know, does this uh, apply also to the fungi that we were, the other fungi. This, I mean, fungi is such a wide group. We're talking about, uh, you know, potentially up to six million species, and there's a lot of them uh, that form these filamentous hyphae. And we wanted to see, you know, can, can you generalize about some of these things? Uh, there was also this other study by Fukasawa where they had also looked at kind of directional memory where they had uh, fed the, the fungus uh, a block of wood in one direction and then see if it would grow out in the same direction to see, um, remembering in which direction they had gotten food. Um, so in order to address this question about the 90, 90 degree angle, in our chip we, we designed uh, so that the fungus would have a choice between growing through uh, these channels where they didn't have to turn more than 90 degrees uh, and these um, channels where they were forced to grow back towards their, their direction of origin. And what we found was that in most cases, uh, the fungi didn't, like the, most of the fungi that we tested, they didn't uh, prefer to grow in the channels uh, where they were forced to grow back towards themselves. But, but there were exceptions and it wasn't all the same. Like you can see in Gymnopus confluence, like they actually uh, grew further in, in those channels when you looked at it over time. Um, so, so I think what we found was that there was some were more directional than others. Um, and what we also saw, even though we weren't able to quantify it, was that with some species, they were, uh, if, you, if you just made the angle like a round, if you made it a roundabout, then they would grow back towards themselves without a problem. So it also becomes the question of like, if it is a directional memory, like how long does it, does it last? Uh, other thing that we explored was the kind of different exploration strategies and uh, there's been these ideas of uh, fungi having this dichotomy between phalanx and gorilla type growth which is what had thing, based on the things that have been observed uh, on these um, compacted soil trays uh, and what they had suggested was that the, there's, the phalanx is similar to these uh, terms have been used to describe for plants that there are clonal plants that grow either as phalanx or gorilla and it's referring to I guess military strategies where phalanx would come like all side by side in force uh, whereas gorilla would send out these kind of runner like uh, little missions and uh, we saw a little bit of that uh, in our uh, 
work, but it wasn't, it wasn't consistent. It wasn't that we could see. There were some that had some of the gorilla uh, type behavior and some of that had some of the phalanx type behavior. And it didn't, uh, it, it was very few species that were very, very clearly phalanx or very clearly gorilla. Um, so we tried to look at other things in terms of their exploration just to, to see if there were uh, other things that we could uh, learn from, from how they explore their environments. So one of the things we looked at was uh, whether they would branch in response to obstacles. But again, there, there, was, there was no clear preference for, like it wasn't that they always branched when they met obstacles. Uh, and just spending all these hours looking at uh, these fungi, we found that they had, you know, very different uh, growth patterns in general. And some of them were hard to quantify. And it was only by kind of looking at them side by side that we could really see that it was, you know, they were all kind of growing differently or approaching their environments so their, and the structural heterogeneity differently. And it must be said too that in these chips, we didn't actually provide them with rewards. We didn't put food in the systems. They were growing in there purely to explore, to try to find uh, nutrients. They were growing from an agar plug, uh, but bringing in just whatever they could bring in through their hyphae into the systems. Uh, but some were a lot more kind of aggressive than others. We'll see the one to the, which one is the pointer? They said this one, uh, <laughs> it would grow very like meanderingly, like it would, it would turn back and around and like there was no, uh, no sense of like most efficient path, I got to get there. And there were others that like, you know, they would grow through open spaces and not even bother to branch and explore the sides. They would just keep going, going, going. They just had to get as far as possible. And then there were others that like would spend so much energy trying to break the bond. Like, so the, what you see in the one next to it, the one that we have kind of compared to the white walkers because it was a little scary looking at them. They would come in these dense fronts and just kind of push in between the PDMS and the glass. So putting enormous force uh, on going forward instead of turning or branching. Uh, we don't know why, but <laughs> this is what they would do. Uh, oh, sorry. And then there was the ones that would fold up a bit. And what we saw also that, uh, especially this, with this one, there was the one that fold up, we said looked a little bit like a, like a snake in some cases, uh, was that it could also change strategy. So if you look at this picture here, if you look in one end of the picture, it looks like one type of growth. Right? And then you look in the other end of the picture, it looks like a com completely different fungus. So how do we kind of generalize for, for these type of things when, you know, this is also not even introducing uh, food into the picture. Uh, they are already, you know, uh, changing strategies uh, just on their own. Um, and another thing that we also saw was that fascinated us was this uh, kind of sometimes inability to to do what seemed like it was would be the most uh, efficient thing to do, like branch or turn, uh, instead of again then trying to just push yourself uh, through, in this case, the corner and break the bond, uh, which would require a lot of effort from the fungus. So in terms of decision making, so we have also like started uh, looking a bit at uh, Arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, now this is uh, in the process of uh, being going through reviews and to be published, but uh, we were able to grow some of these uh, abascular mycorrhizal fungi that uh, can only be grown together with plant roots uh, and that are quite different from the, the basidomyces that I just showed you, in that they have uh, um, these hyphal uh, structures, more that it, they call it sometimes like an amoeba in a in a tunnel because they can move around inside uh, and they don't have these septa, these walls that they uh, block off. And what you can see here is uh, that it's moving inside of uh, the hyphae and how it has abandoned and left kind of empty shells behind uh, on the more less efficient paths uh, that it first explored. 
Uh, so it's, it's really interesting to try to think about this in the ecological co uh, context uh, because these uh, fungi are bringing uh, a lot of carbon down into the soil. And so how does that carbon get stored or um, is it through, how, how does it move carbon around in these tunnels? And what we saw as well with the vascular mycorrhizal fungi was that it would form these spores inside of the chips that it would later empty and we don't really know why, but at the same time, it would still have spores uh, that it didn't empty, like out in the, uh, in the culture uh, that it was connected to. So it, it would, I guess, in a sense, uh, make a decision to empty out the ones that were inside of the chip, which we find really fascinating. So to sum up, this is a small file. I had to pick what I had to show you, but uh, I'm happy to show more if anyone's interested later. But Fungi, they should show behaviors, and it is uh, interesting for us fungal ecologists to try to look at fungi through the eyes of behavioral ecology. Uh, and from what we have seen so far, though there's lots and lots more to explore, uh, there seem to be a lot of strategies and behaviors that can vary widely, even between uh, fungal species that we think fill a similar function out in nature. Uh, and it's time we start learning more about them. So, like I said, I recently got some money to, to start looking more into uh, these fungal interactions in chip systems. And uh, we'll be working both with fungi-fungi interactions and fungal interactions with columbola, as well as fungi and plant roots. And then I have a side project with my colleague in Copenhagen where we want to look at how these fungi that have been domesticated by ants um, how their behavior vary depending on how domesticated they are. And uh, as a final thing as well, I think that has, there have been people saying things throughout the day today that have uh, made me feel like I'm even more interested in to dive into this question, which is whether there are emergent kind of symbiotic behaviors that only occur when fungi are in these uh, interactions with other organisms. So I want to thank uh, my group, or it's not my group, it's mostly Edith's group <laughs> that I'm kind of part of. So we have the, this soil ship project going on where I started off as a postdoc and now I have my own uh, grant to work on my own stuff. Uh, but there's a lot of really great people uh, and some of them are also now independent researchers. Uh, with their own grants at Lund University. And we're, what brings us together is we're all working with these uh, microfluidic systems uh, in the context of soil and fungi and microbes. And then also uh, my collaborators, Lynn Body and Toby Kears and Jonathan Sheik. Uh, I'm looking forward to working more with them. Thank you guys. And this is just for fun. It's from my colleague uh, who did the study where you can see the, the fungi growing into increasingly complex uh, structures in the chips. Um, well, um, listening to your talk, I found myself thinking back to the previous one about neural design. And I'm wondering if you have any ideas about how some of those principles like um, types of signaling or um, how no, um, energy limitation for computation, how that would apply to the fungi that you're studying. Yeah, I mean, there, there is quite a lot of research going on with fungal signaling, and I think for sure it, it's important. It's important signaling between fungi, fungal recognition of self versus non-self, fungal uh, interrupt when, the, when they form the interactions between um, mycorrhizal fungi that form uh, connections with plant roots, there's uh, a lot of signaling going on. So for sure, and I think you know, it'd be interesting if we could find a way to, to study these in the chip systems as well, just to be able to see at the, the hyphal tip level what is actually happening. You showed a picture of an ant with the spore coming out the head. <laughs> this is a really particularly fascinating question because the fungi in the tropics, in old tropics anyway, are 
have somehow perfected an evolutionary trait where they can not only infect ants and reproduce there, but induce the ants or spiders to grow out to the end of branches and hang there so that they can be, they can drop down onto trails and mm -hmm. increase their distribution that way. Fascinating behavior. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. And it, it seems surprising to me that most of the research that's been done on it is from the ants perspective and not from the fungal perspective, right? It has been considered, you know, that the fungi is altering the behavior of the ant, but it hasn't been considered a fungal behavior to do so, which I think it could be. We have a question from the chat. Um, would the copernellus that went straight through an open area, so that was that panel that you showed, uh, still go straight when it enters a chamber for which there is no exit? Like, are, is there any chance that they're sensing the opening? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't think we had any specific ones where there was no exit in the other end um, so I can't answer that offhand but but I mean I think for sure it would be great to do um, more more experiments where we can look at these things and also see kind of do more time-lapse videos and so on to, to see kind of how they're searching their environment as they uh, grow into it yeah yeah and it was it was fascinating to me. I think that in like that it wouldn't branch instead. <laughs> it seemed like that was not the case for that one. Whereas other ones just they branch, branch, branch everywhere. So like a clearly a very different strategy to, to finding their way. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.